What a scene, mashallah, tabarakallah. May Allah preserve and protect all of you uh, for coming out and being a part of this wonderful program. And of course, uh, Dr. Rania, Sada Fadwa, Sada Shamira, the entire Rahma Foundation for hosting and facilitating these beautiful programs and honoring all of us, alhamdulillah. Um, I wanted to, before I jump into my presentation, just, I have a disclaimer. Um, the presentation I'm going to present is going to actually wake us all up. Um, so I'm going to kindly ask that young children be asked to leave because it's pretty intense content. Um, and I don't want any, uh, you know, children to be affected by what I'm going to share. So if you could please take younger children out. If they're asleep, obviously, inshallah, that's fine. But <laughs> just, I think it was 14 plus, right, is what I was told. Yeah. So bismillah. Um, I do have slides, as you can see here. And I apologize in advance if you see any typos. I am on like two hours of sleep, and I was trying to put these together. So I was telling Ustad al that I was nodding off. <laughs> so if you see typos, just ignore them, inshallah. We'll do better, inshallah, next time. But um, the, as we know, um, we are about to, as Dr. Rennie mentioned, we're knocking on the doors of the last 10 nights. Um, and something that occurred to me, subhanAllah, is that as we start the month of Ramadan, we know that the first 10 days are the days of, or nights of mercy, correct? So, and then the middle is forgiveness, and then the last 10 days are, of course, seeking refuge from the fire. And so it occurred to me that, subhanAllah, Allah, in, 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 um, in the beginning of the month, He eases us into the month, right, with with mercy and then it starts to get a little uncomfortable because you know to focus on forgiveness requires honesty requires transparency requires really digging deep and looking at oneself um you know with with uh with you know with with that lens of of, of real honesty and, and critique or you know critically i should say and, and that's uncomfortable for some of us we don't really want to face um, those things that we may have been buried all along. And then subhanAllah, we get to the end of the month and even though the fast is getting easier, right? So if, uh, physically, we're kind of acclimated, we're used to it, the schedule, the lack of caffeine, the, slack, the, the sleeplessness, we're used to it physically, but then subhanAllah, emotionally, spiritually, it's actually becoming more constricting, right? Because to think about the fire, I think for a lot of people, is also uncomfortable. We tend to lean on, which we should, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thinking always of the rewards awaiting us. So to actually completely focus on something that maybe um, is, is, is a little bit, you know, it's more intimidating, it's, it's more constricting is, is hard, but we're supposed to be doing that. So that's where, inshallah, this presentation hopefully will take us um, through this concept of how to seek protection from the fire inshallah, in the next, in the, in the last 10 nights. So bismillah, with that said, I want to ask a few questions here. Like, first of all, what is the fire, right? Some of us may have an idea, you know, of this scorching, terrible, you know, um, yeah, place, because it is a living place, but um, we may not really understand uh, the descriptions or may not re have read the descriptions. So um, just to have a little bit more detail about what the fire is, here is a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually warning us. A'udhu billahi min shaytan al-rajim. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire, whose fuel is men and stones, over which are appointed angels stern and severe, who disobey not from executing the commands they receive from Allah but do that which they are commanded. So right away we understand that this is obviously um, a, a, a place that is real. It, it's, it's, it's in existence even as we speak and it will have this uh, life in a sense that it um, 
it, it has an appetite for, for men in stones, and it, see, and it com communicates that. And there are other verses where the fire is actually calling and, and in a way communicating. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, soon I will cast them into the fire, and what will explain to you what the scorching fire is? It lets nothing remain and leaves nothing unburned, scorching the skin. Over it are 19 angels. Again, these are, I mean, obviously terrifying for a reason, because we're supposed to really think about what we need to do to avoid any, being anywhere near it, having any sense of it, because it has a, um, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a, a smell to it, there's a, you know, there, there's, there's, our senses can perceive it, so we don't want any part of this, right? So we need to understand that it is a very intense reality. And so the verses, as painful and as uncomfortable as, as it is, we, we should read them and contemplate them and then think deeply. Um, I'm, I'm actually reminded just last night, I believe, no, the night before, I was on a, um, I think it was last night, sorry, my memory is so off because I'm on such little sleep. But a couple, uh, last night I was on a Celebrate Mercy talk with Dr. Asad Tarsin and Sheikh Muslim Permal, and we were also um, going over just 19 Surat um, uh, Furqan. And Dr. Asad brought up some verses that were very um, terrifying because they, the same, uh, you know, as we're reading, there, there were these images that I hadn't really thought of um, until he mentioned them. But in one of the verses, um, he talked about how uh, actually, I'll read, I'll, I did, I have it here, so let me read it here. He says, this is uh, Surah Furqan, verse 25. So it's talking actually about the unfolding of the Day of Judgment and what's going to happen. It's very rapid. A lot of the scenes that we read in the Quran just reflect the intensity of that day and then what happens afterwards. So he said, Allah subhanahu wa says, watch for the day the heavens will burst with clouds and the angels will be sent down in successive ranks. True authority on that day will belong only to the most compassionate and it will be a hard day for the disbelievers. And then, and beware of the day the wrongdoer will bite his nails in regret and say, oh, I wish I had followed the way along with the messenger. Woe to me, I wish I had never taken so-and-so as a close friend. It, it was he who truly made me stray from the reminder after it had reached me, and Satan always betrayed humanity. And then it goes on. But that image of, you know, a person who's a wrongdoer, a disbeliever, biting their nails, this is, you know, um, oh, did it go out? Sorry. So that image, right, of a person biting their nails in regret, um, we, we talked a little bit about that, and it's just so human, right? The experience of, you know, we, we've done that. I'm sure when we, you know, it's, it's something that we do when we're uh, regretful of something, but to imagine that people on that day will be filled with so much regret for their wrongdoings, and then, of course, the scapegoating, blaming their companions. So it's this chaotic scene that unfolds, and, you know, uh, we, we, if we're not reading these verses and almost not imagining them, then we're forgetting that you know, these are real things that are going to happen and we need to seek protection for ourselves and our family from ever being a part of those scenes, right? And so that's where the, it's so necessary to contemplate on these verses because as intense as I said and, and uh, uncomfortable as they are, we want to not be a part of them. We want to have nothing to do with them. So when we read these scenes, like the, you know, scorching of the skin, a'udhu billah, may Allah protect every one of us and our loved ones from ever experiencing anything like that. Um, and this is, again, the, begs the question now, how can we protect ourselves? What do we need to do? Well, we need to know what the fire is for, right? It's the fuel of it is men and stones, which people is the, uh, it calls, uh, does the fire call for? So we do have in the various verses of the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa describes different people who will be punished um, because of their you know, different actions. So the disbelievers, those are obvious. The hypocrites, of course, are in the lowest parts of hell. But then there are other groups that are a little bit more generalized, right? So the arrogant deniers of truth, sinners and criminals, unjust oppressors, those who proudly disobey Allah, so this is where, again, this is more general. Sinning, as we know, is, you know, we all are sinners, but those 
who sin and then brag about them. They share their sins openly. This is a different degree that we really have to ask Allah SWT for forgiveness for if we've ever shared our sins openly, if we've ever been proud of our sins or displayed them. Now with social media and this, you know, the culture around us, there is a lot of this you know, open uh, sin, sinfulness. Whereas before, people had at least some degree of, of modesty, of shame. So proudly disobeying Allah. Tyrants, murderers, again, these are groups that are obvious to us, but then those who persecute the believers, those who prefer the world and neglect the hereafter. So those with hubba dunya. Again, many of us may fall into these categories. We, we're, we're, we're chasing dunya, we're heedless, we're in ghafla. And in Ramadan, obviously, you know, alhamdulillah, we're obviously all here. There is a degree of awareness. We're a little bit more aware of ourselves. But if we relapse and we start to regress as soon as the month is over and we find ourselves abandoning the prayer, abandoning the book of Allah, abandoning our worship, no longer, you know, taking inventory of, our, of what comes out of our mouth, what the words that we say, what we're putting into our hearts and our, you know, our vessels, our hearts, what we're listening to, what we're watching. If we're not doing that, then we're going to slip right back into that state of ghafla. And may Allah, again, forgive us because if we leave the world in that state, we don't know our ultimate fate. But of course, we, uh, we always have the highest opinion of Allah that He is the most forgiving, the most compassionate, especially towards the believers. But generally speaking, none of us should feel safe. And that's really why the emphasis in the last 10 nights is to think about the fire because just because we're fasting, just because we're praying, just because we're reading Quran and we're standing for Qiyam and we're praying Tahajjud and we're coming to the Masjid does not ensure any of us safety. And the moment we start to think that our deeds are going to be the insurance that protects us from the fire, that is actually a very dangerous sign. So reading into these verses and contemplating the different categories of people who will be punished is really good for the nafs, it's good for the soul to, to humble ourselves that perhaps because we don't know our end, perhaps, uh, you know, if, if Allah, uh, if, if, if we, you know, continue to be neglectful, if we continue to, uh, to fail to heed the warnings, we may find ourselves in any of these categories. And in order to prevent that, of course, that's where we'll get to in a moment what we need to do proactively. But again, recognizing these categories, cruel, proud, and arrogant people. So if you've ever been cruel, think about you know, who that may apply to. Uh, there are you know, people in our community that struggle with anger and they have an anger management problem. This can be um, shown to their family members. It can be shown to strangers, uh, you know, on the road uh, or, or, you know, in service. People blow up, and this is a very common problem now, where people just, you know, they can't handle the, their own maybe uh, pressures and, and whatever's going on with them, themselves personally, and then they take it out on innocent people. You know, you go to a restaurant, someone doesn't serve you, and all of a sudden you're exploding, you're, you're calling customer service, you're complaining, you're just this person who's trying to always get someone. Why? Because maybe there's things you haven't worked out. So if you have that tendency to let your anger uh, overcome you, this is something to, again, be, be mindful of, because cruelty and, and injustice in that way has no place in the heart of the believer. Treacherous people, traitors, Liars, gossipers, and talebearers, people who lie, deceive, gossip. We know about how odious backbiting is. It's akin to cannibalism, literally in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens to uh, gossip to cannibalism. So if we're gossiping, we're talking about so-and-so's marriage or so-and-so's divorce or so-and-so's moving from here to there and so-and-so's husband lost her job and can you believe so-and-so, you know, his husband did this or wife did this. Why? Why do we care? Why do we care about anybody else's personal life? It leave, you know, this is a sign of, of, again, a person, it's a sign of spiritual disease. The Prophet said him warned that the one who is, uh, you know, busy, with, with, uh, with other people, or, or it's better for you to be preoccupied with your own uh, problems than to worry about other people. And then we also know the very clear hadith where he tells us, Min husni islam al ma la yani. part of the beauty of one's Islam is that you leave that which does not concern you. So you literally mind your own business. But if we're gossiping and we're taking these things lightly, we don't, we're, we're not realizing that we could very well be landing ourselves in a very, very, 
compromised position. Again, wa Those who neglect their prayers. Very important that if we don't wake up to the reality that the prayer is the most fundamental thing that we do. There is nothing more important than your salah and my salah. Nothing. Nothing more important. If you, and I, you know, I had a sister, mashallah, I remember, may Allah bless her. I spoke with her actually this past weekend. She came up to me and I don't know if she's here, but may Allah bless her. Because last year she came to a halaqa and she was just sharing that she had a very difficult time with managing her worship and her work. And so we were talking about how to logistically fix that. She said that, you know, it's hard for her to get to her worship because she has so much work to do. So alhamdulillah, I just gave her an asiha and I said, well, maybe you have to switch it. Maybe you have to do your worship first and then get to your work. It was just a very simple nasiha, alhamdulillah. I didn't think much of it. I just gave the advice that we've been given. Pr plan your life around your prayer, not the other way around. So alhamdulillah, when I saw her this past weekend, she came up to me and she was just, she just said it. She said, I have to say something to you. So I have to thank you. You know, you gave me this advice last year and it completely changed my life. Subhanallah, just such simple words. It's a paradigm shift, right? Because a lot of us are so focused on raising our children, taking care of our parents if we have elderly parents, you know, paying the bills, going to work, going to school, and we keep putting all these things on our, you know, I mean, there, there's, it's just this never-ending to-do list, never-ending list of responsibilities we have. And then we plug in prayer whenever it's convenient. And then we wonder why we're never at peace. It's a formula that is it's destined to fail. You will never find peace if you're going to do that. Whereas when you prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then plan your life, you find that Allah will give you tawfiq, He'll expand your time, you'll suddenly have peace. So that's what she experienced. She said, this past year, alhamdulillah, that's what she did. She started to wake up early, do her tahajjud, do her fajr prayer, get her ibadah in, and then she started her work. And she said everything changed for her. And she was just very happy to report this change. Alhamdulillah wa shukurillah. So these are very real experiences, but again, many of us in Ramadan, we're on top of our prayers. We have a full 30 days. Allah is showing us we're very capable of doing it. But what happens as soon as the month is over? Something goes wrong because it, we're not afraid enough. And that's where when you read that, you know, the, 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 the punishment, does anyone know? I remember reading this a long time ago and it always stayed with me. Does anyone know the punishment of missing one prayer without a good reason, what it is. It is, I think it's called either a, a, a laqab or a haqab, I can't remember the Arabic term, but it's basically a period of 80 years of torment in the fire. For missing a prayer without a valid reason. So just be like, oh, I'm lazy, or oops, oops, I missed fajr, oops. I guess I'll just do it tomorrow, or maybe, maybe. If you miss Fajr and you wake up without a sense of panic, like, Ya Allah, I like regret, like deep, deep fear. There's something wrong. Because yes, we're human. Yes, the alarm may not have gone off. That's, that, that are, that's, those are all things that we don't need to make a case. Allah knows what happened. It's the state of our hearts that we want to present to our Creator. When we come into the realization, when we wake up from that sleep state, it's the state that you present to your creator. And regret should be the number one state. So jumping up from bed, running to the bathroom, and making wudu, even if it's 10 minutes late, 20 minutes late, it doesn't matter. Because you want to show your creator that you're so remorseful, that even though you were asleep and it wasn't intentional, the idea that you missed the call of prayer, that you missed the opportunity to worship your Creator as He so deserves, is enough to put you in a state, to induce a state of panic and terror and fear in your heart. If that's not happening and you're just like, oh well, or as we've talked about before, missing, you know, prayers because, oh, I have a wedding to go to. This is probably one of the things that I just will never understand I love protect our hearts and forgive us for ever, ever, ever thinking that a social event, even a celebratory event, is a good enough excuse to miss worshiping your Creator. Like, oh, I have this, you know, big, heavy, fancy dress and makeup, I, you know, Allah will understand. But this is the kind of, you know, illogic uh, and excuses that the nafs will make. So these are the types of warnings we have to heed. 
And again, when we read the different descriptions, that one, I mean, I should have maybe highlighted that because I think it's the most relatable. We have a problem of people, you know, and I know, and I'm sure Dr. Rania knows, and many of the other teachers here know, this is a struggle that a lot of us have, is not being on top of our prayers. So if we take anything from when we read the descriptions of the fire, it is, that is the most important way to protect ourselves. Manage your prayers, do anything and everything you can to make sure you're doing your prayers on time. Anything and everything, there's really no excuse. Whatever you need to do, whatever you need to do, and I say that wallahi with no equivocation, I'm not, there's no exaggeration there. Whatever you need to do to fix your prayer, do it. Whatever you need, if you need five alarms, 10 alarms, do it. Because it is the number one thing we're gonna be asked about on the day of judgment. If you're hustling, if you're taking care of your kids, all those things are great. They're mashallah, amazing deeds, but they're not gonna measure up on the scales if you're missing your salah, they're just not. You could be serving the ummah, you could be out there working in soup kitchens and feeding the homeless, you could be traveling all over the world, but if you're neglectful over your prayers, it's not going to measure up. So get on top of your prayers and make sure after, I mean right now we should all have that niyyah that inshallah as long as I live and breathe I will never ever abandon my prayers and I will never take lightly missing a prayer ever. Like I will never do that. I will always feel the weight of missing prayers. And may Allah guide us to really take our prayers seriously. Obscene and perverse, uh, perver you know, anything that's perverse. If you're a, an obscene person, what does that mean? Dirty jokes. Why are we telling dirty jokes? Why are we watching inappropriate material like comedians who are foul and disgusting? Why do we watch television programs and films that talk about things that are crude? This is so reprehensible. We are supposed to be the hallmark quality of the believers, not just women, men and women, is modesty, is hayat. So if we are wearing our hijabs, but then, I mean, subhanAllah, there's, you know, programs and, and um, you know, all these social media accounts now, may Allah guide our ummah, of women in hijab, full hijab, talking about very inappropriate things with men on podcast episodes, what is happening? What is happening in our ummah where single men and women, they're not even married, are having these, what, intellectual discussions about intimacy in the bedroom with, with non-mahram men? What is happening? A'udhu billah, this is not part of our deen. We, we have boundaries of what to talk about, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Foul jokes, cursing, music that's inappropriate, topics that are inappropriate are haram. They're in the category of haram. So to be very aware of that and not make excuses. If we do these things, we again compromise our position. And that's why we have to heed these warnings. Adulterers and cheaters, you'd be surprised how common this is in our community. May Allah guide us, may Allah protect us. If you are single, make dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you a righteous spouse to protect you from falling into zina. If you are married, guard your chastity, guard your modesty, lower your gaze. Do not take it lightly talking with the opposite gender. It is not a light thing to do. If you work, I mean, I, I've, I've heard enough stories in my lifetime May Allah again protect our hearts and protect our marriages and protect our homes and protect our families. Because shaitan is out for us. He knows, especially in this day and age, that the Muslim community being the last maybe community that really preserves marriage and family, he's coming for us. He is coming for our community. He's already broken uh, many other communities apart. They don't even have, they don't even take marriage seriously. Alhamdulillah, we're still marrying. But if we're marrying and then we're being loosey-goosey, you know, we're, we're interacting with the opposite gender in a way that is unbecoming, inappropriate. A'udhu Billah. So we have to take these things very seriously to guard our chastity, to guard our modesty, lower our gaze. When you're speaking with brothers, if you are, again, single, don't put yourself in that situation of, you know, uh, of attracting that type of attention. Uh, just because, you know, you, if you want to get married, do it the right way. Make dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only way you will have any risk is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not going and putting yourself out there, getting dressed up, wearing a lot of makeup, putting on very tight-fitting clothing, walking around with very sexualized energy. This is not the way to do it. 
And if we do these things, may Allah forgive us, it's not the end for us, obviously, there's always hope, but we have to turn that around. And the way that we turn that around is to adopt the, the, the necessary uh, comportment, the necessary disposition of a believer, not just a believing woman, because again, these are rules for both men and women. A believer is modest. A believer does not put themselves out there in that way. Those who take usury, those who practice sorcery and magic, and I don't know what the last one was, those who, maybe they would leave that blank. <laughs> May Allah forgive and protect all of us. SubhanAllah. But uh, there are many categories, right? And I just wanted to share, when the Prophet ﷺ went on Isra wal Miraj, we know that he was given, uh, you know, he saw a lot of things that really disturbed him, that really troubled him. Um, and among them, right, were very clear descriptions. And if you haven't read these hadith, I encourage you to read them because they're terrifying, right? Uh, here the Prophet ﷺ said, when I was taken on my night journey, I passed by people who had metal hooks in their hands and they were clawing at their faces and necks. Just imagine that. It's, it's, astaghfirullah, I just can't imagine it. I said, who are these people, Jibreel? Jibreel Aisam said, these are the ones who eat the flesh of people and attack their honor. So for those who gossip, for those who like to spread lies, a'udhu billah, this is what our faith will be. May God protect all of us and forgive any one of us who's ever spoken ill of another person behind their back. I saw some men on the night of my ascension whose lips were being sheared by scissors of fire. I said, O oh, Jabir, who are these people? Preachers from your nation who commanded people to be righteous and they forgot it themselves, yet they recited the book. Will they not reason? This is for those of us who are in a teaching position. We have to heed these warnings. May Allah forgive us for ever coming and sharing or you know, calling people to things that we don't ourselves do. This would be the ultimate sign of hypocrisy. But these warnings are there for us to, to really think about. I saw a dream at night which two men came to me. They said, one who, they said the one whose face you saw being torn away was a great liar who would tell a lie and it would be carried until it reaches the horizons. This will be done to him until the day of resurrection. Astaghfirullah. Again, having your face being ripped apart because you are a liar. And there's many very, very graphic descriptions of the torments of people, specific people, dragged on their face. You know, things happening to them. All of it, it's not, you know, the Prophet, he was Bashir wa Nadir. He came to warn us not to just, you know, give us these gory descriptions so that we go, ooh, that's so scary. No, it's to actually... Ya Allah, please don't let me be a part of ever that scene, witness it or be a part of it. Ya Allah, protect me and my loved ones. And to really take that seriously, because if you think that you couldn't be, like it's, you're otherizing it, it's like, oh, that's not going to happen to me. That's the first sign of, of delusion. We should all be terrified. At one point he saw a big bull with horns come out, a small hole, but then he struggled to go back down in it. So this is a more descriptive scene of this uh, bull that's trying to go through this hole. Um, and he couldn't. And then when the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel really what it was, he said words that had been uttered but could not ta be taken back. That's such a powerful, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Not metaphor, but visual of, what is it? Imagery. Thank you, imagery. Of words that are said that can't be taken back. Many of us say things that are so hurtful, that are so painful. If you cut someone down, whether it's a relative, your sibling, your, you know, your spouse, your child, because you have a razor sharp tongue. Heed this warning and ask Allah SWT to forgive you if you've ever emasculated someone. You know, we know women, we know how to do it. I know, I know how to do it. I mean, I admit, I admit it, I can, we can do it. You see, men are very, you know, they're fragile, their egos are, you could easily just take one little thing, just cut them into shreds if you wanted to, if you have that, Capacity, And I know we all know how to do it. Don't act like you don't. But if you've ever done it, may Allah forgive all of us for ever going there. Or, you know, hurting anybody. Our siblings, um, friends, sometimes we say things because we're, we're, we're passive aggressive, you know. We're, we're burying resentment. We don't know how to cope with certain things. So we just weaponize our, our words and we hurt people. And if we've ever done that, we should really take that seriously and ask Allah to forgive the harms of our tongue and whether we know it or not sometimes we do it and we don't we're not even aware of it and that's why comprehensive istighfar is 
the, the sins that I've done uh, that I'm aware of and that I'm not aware of, S big and small. Be very comprehensive when you make uh, toba for these things. Um, and I'm sorry, I know I might be out of time. I'm just going to go through the rest of these quickly. This is also really, I mean, I really encourage you to read the descriptions of Surah Al-Qaf about the Day of Judgment and the trumpet being blown and what will happen. It's just that the imagery is so powerful, but I wanted to share, so I'll, I'll try to go through these quickly. And the trumpet will be blown. This is the day you were warned of. If we're reading the verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the warning, but if we're not going to read them, we're not going to pay them much attention, we're just going to focus on Jannah, which of course is, we should do that too. But they, it's a balance that we have to maintain. So Allah's warning us, and every soul will come with it a driver and a witness. There's two angels, one that drives us to our judgment, and then a witness who will stand to bear witness to the judgment. It will be said, you were certainly unmindful of this, and now we have removed from you your cover, so your sight this day is sharp. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. Our, you know, uh, our. Um, reluctance to actually be mindful of these punishments. We don't want to read them, it's uncomfortable. Allah is telling us, you were certainly unmindful. Now, the veil has been removed. You're gonna see it all. 